think the Apostle Paul probably could have joined in almost any of those songs and sing, especially as we look at today's text, which is in Philippians chapter 1. We did find that Eric has many favorite songs. <laughs> so, um, and that's not a bad thing either, is it? So finding a purpose, probably everybody here at some point, maybe even now, are uh, deep in trying to find out why exactly am I here? What, what am I here for? I read once that, um, that we're here for others, but then the question becomes, well, then what are others here for? Um, I don't know. Why am I here? I, I don't know that anybody here could give the answer of, well, I'm here to find a cure for cancer. Probably not. Uh, or maybe just to constantly bring championships to the North Coast. Um, or to feed the world or, or whatever. I mean, we're probably not that big of, um, of a deal. But I think we are here for reasons. And I think we'll see something to that. It's important to remember that we're here because God placed us here. We're here because of God. And we're here to do things for God, to bring honor to God, to exalt him, and, and to do all that we can to proclaim him. And we're here for other people. We're here to serve others and to be a part of their lives and to care. And uh, so we want to honor God and we want to bring as many others with us to that point of honoring him. Help them become closer to him. Often I have had the experience for many years, decades, of speaking with someone as they're approaching toward the end of their life. And I've heard more than once someone tell me that because of their present condition, because of their present state of being, they wonder what's the point that they're still here. Why doesn't God just let me go home? Um, I'm not able to sing or play an instrument or, or uh, teach a lesson or, or be even with the rest of the people, whatever their explanation is. Why doesn't God just take me now? And I think we have to remember and remind ourselves that, that there is purpose, that God has us here to exalt him and to serve and, and to help others as well. And no matter what condition you are in, Physically, you could probably still fulfill um, those two things. Last week, when we looked at the earlier part of chapter 1, uh, we, we need to recall that Paul is writing this letter from a Roman house arrest prison. Uh, he's cuffed closely to some prison guards, and he's writing to different churches and trying to meet their specific needs, what, what's going on in those churches. So he understands what's going on in Philippi. He knows what's happening there. He knows the people. He had started that church. And so, um, and he was a Buckeye fan too. So um, I'm sure of that. So. <laughs> so boy, that's always awkward, isn't it? So I'm sorry about that. I'll never forget years and years ago uh, when cell phones were really getting popular and I thought I was going to be really cool one Sunday morning and I just kind of made one of those general announcements that if you have a cell phone turn it off and and I went on and on and I said and besides nobody here none of us are that important that we need to get a call right now and about halfway through the message uh, back in that same corner a cell phone went off and I thought oh they didn't listen it was Carol Snyder. She was getting summons to go to an emergency surgery. It's like, okay, I'm an idiot. So, um, so you know, I don't mind that at all. It's not a big deal. Uh, we all live in the real world, don't we? So, last week we looked at the fact that God and is able to do good things for you, do things that can honor Him even in the middle of the most difficult circumstances that we might be experiencing. No matter how hard it is, no matter what rotten stuff is going on in our lives, God is God enough that he can overcome that and help us and do things that bring honor to him. He also, um, Paul shared with us, that even in the midst of personal conflict between us and other people, that God can work in us somehow 
to bring honor to himself, bring us closer to him. And the whole point of it that Paul was trying to say then was that ultimately, no matter what happens, we must exalt Jesus Christ. That's what our purpose is. So I think I told you before that um, in Philippians, we're going to see some of the principles of joy. Chapter 1 is going to tell us that your life must be centered on Jesus Christ. So that's where we're at right now in chapter 1. Next week, we'll start chapter 2 that tells us we need to be conformed to Jesus Christ. And chapter 3 will tell us that we need to be controlled by Jesus Christ. And chapter 4 will tell us that we need to be complete in Jesus Christ. So that's just a reminder of where we're going. <clears throat> this particular chapter that we're in, chapter 1, tells us that we need to be centered in Jesus Christ. To live is all about Jesus Christ. Verse 21, Paul said this, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And that's a verse many of you have heard. Maybe you've even used it and quoted it at times. So for Paul, when he was alive, everything that he did centered around Jesus Christ. He was the focal point of everything. But then he also tells us here that once he's in that state of death, he's not talking about the dying process, but once he is now deceased, he knew that that was going to be so much better than anything here because he was actually going to be with Jesus Christ. So for him, life was good. Everything was good because it all centered on Jesus and everything he did was about Jesus because Jesus did so much for him. He just couldn't help but to do so much more for Jesus. But as great as that is, someday Paul thought he'll actually be with Jesus. What a tremendous, tremendous blessing he considered that to be. So he's going to talk about what it's like to remain here in verses 22 to 26. I'll read those to you. He said, if I am going on, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Paul expected to live... Uh, he, he felt that even though he knew that at any moment he could be snuffed out by the Roman government, he knew that, but he understood that there was a need among the Philippian believers, and somehow God impressed in his heart that he was going to be there to make it with them. Um, when he says, if I'm going to be here, he really means since, and it's going to happen. He, he knew that staying here meant service to them. He knew that God had a purpose and that he was going to be serving and honoring them. He felt that he was going to be released from his prison. He felt that there was so much that God wanted him to do that he was going to be released and, and be able to go and, and minister to these people. No matter what God was going to do, no matter how much time was left for him, no matter what the circumstances were going to be, Paul felt that the time is now. <laughs> The time is now to start serving Christ. The time is now to impact other people. The time is now to build those relationships where you can serve others and help bring them closer to Jesus Christ. He knew he could be gone in a moment. And he knew he needed to serve them right now. He also knew that the only reason for living is really Jesus Christ. There's no other point to this life, is there? I don't know. You know, is everything about work? Is everything about groceries? Is everything about sports? I don't think so. 
You name the category. The whole point of why we are here is because of the one who made us and created everything, Jesus Christ. So we should fix our eyes upon him. And then we will be fruitful. Paul said that, you know, if I remain in this body and I continue to be here, that means I can have a fruitful labor with you. If God allows me to live longer, Paul says, I'm going to make sure I take advantage of that, and I'm going to make sure that what I do on your behalf is going to be beneficial to you and honoring to Jesus Christ. There's no doubt about that in his mind. But then he goes on to say he has a problem. He has a problem, and his problem is that he's torn between these two dilemmas. There's one dilemma of... Uh, this life, with all the other trappings it has with it, still affords me the opportunity to serve people, bring them closer to Christ. I can honor Jesus. I can help others. There's a lot of great good that can happen here. But however, on the other hand, if I'm not here, and if God takes me home, I'm going to be with Jesus Christ in all his glory, in all his presence, and everywhere that he is, I can be that's pretty spectacular. That verse there where he tells us that he's torn between the two is kind of interesting. I think the King James translates it as though I am in a straight betwixt two. I love the word betwixt. It makes me think of chocolate bars or something. But um, the New American Standard says, but I am hard pressed from both directions. Actually, it really means maybe you would say it this way. I'm hemmed in on both sides by the two. I am in between these two rocks, and I'm stuck. Um, there's this great thing about being here and loving people and being with them and serving them and, and doing everything I can for them and all the joys. Paul's thinking about the joys of that. He's thinking about seeing people come to Christ. He's thinking about people that are growing stronger in their faith, and they're doing the work of the ministry. And, and there's just a lot that needs to be done. Jesus needs and deserves a lot of honor and a lot of glory. And Paul sees that, and, and, and he's totally, he's all in with that. But on the other hand, <laughs> there's some pretty great things that God has in store for us when we step out of this world. I always think of the song, I, I like it so much, um, the song, Finally Home, and um, you know, breathing new air, uh, finding it's celestial, touching a hand, finding it's God. I, I mean, it's just all those things that God has for us. It's pretty amazing. And he sees that as an equal pressure situation. You know, I think it's good that God gives you and I and everybody else a desire to be here and to enjoy this life and to live for him and to honor uh, him and, and others as well. I think he puts that desire in us because otherwise it is absolutely stupid to stay here when there's so much there. Why would we want to be here when everything there for eternity is way, 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 way better. Much, much more wonderful stuff there. Paul knew that we stay here. There's people we love. We pour ourselves into them, and, and that's what we want to do to serve Jesus Christ the most we can. Go there. We can see Christ. His desire was to depart. He had a that the word there about his desire, it, it literally means he has a passionate desire. He really, really wanted to be with Jesus. Uh, you know, he was getting sick of the jails. He was getting sick of the beatings. He was getting sick of all the opposition that was against him. It was getting to be very, very frustrating. And he knew what he had ahead of him. It's like, that's what I'm doing this for. That's what I want. I want to be there with Jesus someday. He said he had a passionate desire to depart from this world. The word depart, there's kind of interesting. In extra biblical material, we found that same word depart used in a couple different scenarios. One was um, when a boat was going to take off from the shore and they pulled up the anchors and the ropes and then they, they took off. That's a, that's a good one and we could use it a lot. But I'm pretty sure Paul 
was probably thinking of the other one. It had to do with taking down a tent. And since Paul was a tent maker, he was probably thinking about that. And you know what it's like, you do camping and, and now it's time to go. And you just start, you start pulling up the stakes and the ropes and everything starts to collapse and you fold it up and you put it away. And Paul saw that as how his life was coming to an end someday. I'm just gonna put down the tents to pull up stakes get unrooted, and I'm going to fold this thing up, and I'm going to go home. And that's how he saw someday being with Jesus. Either way, whether I'm still here living or whether I'm with Jesus' death, my whole motivation is Jesus Christ. That's his life. That's your life. Everything you do today, everything you think, everything you do, all of that has to do with preparation for the future, for someday being with Jesus Christ for all eternity. What goes on here will go on before us into eternity. Everything in this life has a purpose. Everything influences us. It all builds into us who we are. We're all practicing and preparing for eternity. This is only a test. It's just a test. If it was an actual alert, I would let you know. But it's just a test, preparing us for when we go to be with Jesus. Paul said it's necessary, and I would say more necessary, for him to be here at that moment when he was writing so that he could help and serve those. He was willing to give up all of that glory, whatever rewards he was going to get, uh, all the pleasures of being with Jesus Christ, he was willing to postpone all that for their sakes and for their need. God wants you to long for him. Yes, he does. He wants you to have a heart that just desires to be with him, to know him more fully, to be with him face to face someday. But he also wants us to be invested in this life here and now, serving him for his glory. <clears throat> Somehow God impressed upon Paul the need to be here. Paul was convinced of it. He was absolutely convinced somehow that he was going to be here for a little bit longer. And he believed God was going to give him opportunities to serve. In verse 25, he, he says about, he wants to continue with all you for your progress. You remember the word progress because it's the same word we talked about last week. That word, remember that um, the Roman soldiers would use for that pioneer group that would go ahead of them and chop down the trees in the forest so that they could have a clear path to go through. That's the progress that Paul was looking for. He, we're paving a road for others to come to see Jesus Christ. They're going to have joy as they serve him. And, and they had joy because they could look at Paul in prison and see that even though he was in prison, his ministry, his life, was having a great impact on a lot of other people. He was being persecuted, and yet God was being honored and blessed and furthered. And they could look at that and say, you know what? God can do stuff in my life, too. I'm not in prison. I'm not being beaten. But God can work through me. If he could take that adverse of a situation, maybe my minor trials, he could bring some glory to himself if I only allow him. Verse 27 through the end of the chapter talks about, Paul tells us about facing opposition. And this is not pretty, what he's going to tell us here. I'll read some of it. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God himself. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggles you saw I had and now hear that I have. Paul says, you know, this life is not a fairy tale. 
Uh, there's not always a happy ending for every single story that we hear about. There's tough times ahead, some pretty rough things that can happen, persecution kinds of things. And I think I told you a couple weeks ago about Francis Chan suggesting that he thinks America's walking into that now. And there's a lot of other people who think that too, that we may be facing some of those hard kind of things because of our faith uh, that may go beyond the idea of um, having to pay fees because you won't serve certain people because of your faith or, or whatever struggles we have. There could be things ahead that could be very difficult for us. Paul says, if I keep on living, you should think, if I keep on living, it's for your sake, Lord, and, and we want to do the best we can. I think Paul was also, in a sense, saying to the Philippians, if I keep on living, and I keep on serving, and I keep pouring myself into you, and I keep trying to do things that help you, you better do well. <laughs> if I'm going to risk my life on this for your sake, I sure hope you follow up and do a good job in, in your life in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote elsewhere to the um, church in Ephesus, it's the memory verse this week, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. It is essential that you do the very best you can worthy of the calling you receive. You have been called to be a child of God the creator of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. You're his possession. You need to live that way. He used the word conduct in verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy. That, that word is an interesting word. If you were to take the Greek word for it, bring it into the English word, it would be very close to our word politic, or political. Um, now, don't get all the bad connotations there, but it's basically telling us that we need to live in a sense that it's a good citizen kind of living. Uh, our public duties, our manner of life, our behavior, all of that is to be as a good Christian citizen. Paul says, if I'm going to put my life on the line, you better make it worth it for me. <laughs> you better be the best you can be. Trust God to give you courage and wisdom. Begin to live in a way that is worthy of the Lord of this universe. Represent him well. The main requirement, he says, is to stand firm. Stand firm. Just be a rock in your faith. Don't move out of your position. Don't let that opposition cause you to retreat. Act upon yourselves. Make it so that you recognize your duty with respect to your heavenly citizenship. Hold yourself to that. This world is not your home. This is not the final place. There's so much more for us. You're obligated to obey God. But it's also a privilege and a position that he's placed you in as his child, as his ambassador. So you stand firm, you stand fast, you stand upright, you hold your ground, you do what God has impressed in your heart to do. And when you do that, the opposition, those who are against you, those who may be persecuting you at the time, all of them, whether they realize it fully or not, are getting the message that they're going to lose, they're going to be destroyed. Because the one that's in you is greater than what's in the rest of this world. And you can prove to yourself also that you are genuine, that it's real, and that God has a strong grasp in your life. We're not contending. When he says to contend for the faith, it's not just fight for your own personal well-being faith, but he's talking about the whole context of the faith of Christianity, everything, the truth and the testimonies of 2,000 years, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, everything uh, we are living for. And when he uses that word to contend, 
for that. Um, that's actually a very athletic word. It talks about uh, competition and, and about teams that come together and, and cooperate for one cause. It's perfect coordination. Do perfect coordination in standing for, for Jesus Christ. It's the good news that Christ is the Savior. So don't be scared. I've read before and, and said it on some occasions that someone did the math, I didn't, but someone said that uh, the, the little phrase, fear not, you've seen it in the Bible, you know, the angels said to Joseph, fear not. Uh, you see the phrase, fear not, 365 times in the Bible, supposedly. Again, I didn't count them. Um, and then the suggestion is that's one for every day of the year. Fear not. You know, there's no reason to be afraid. My question is what happens on leap years? But um, Paul knew his destiny. Paul knew his destiny. He knew what his lot was. He knew that he was to believe in Christ and to suffer for him. Throughout time, all around the world, Christians have suffered. They say that there's been more Christian martyrs in the 1900s, the previous century that we just ended 15 years ago. There were more Christian martyrs in that one century than there had been in the 1900 years before that. Part of it is there was more population too, but um, that just shows you that this thing's not going away. It's not going away. And we see it almost every day now on the television or, or maybe you see it in social media somewhere of another persecuted group somewhere in, in the world um, that's really taken a beating for Christ. It's kind of rare in our world, in our time here. We see a lot of peace. We see some harmony with people around us, even if we don't agree with them. We tend to be okay with them in our culture. But this is not the norm. This is not what it's like in the rest of the, most of the world. Christians have been really taking a beating. And in our world, it certainly seems to be changing uh, toward the worse. That prospect terrifies us, and it did for them also. I don't think the Philippians looked at it and said, you mean we're going to be persecuted? We're going to be beaten and put to death? Wow, that's great. I don't think they took that view. I think it was frightening to them as well. But they took comfort in seeing Paul go through his suffering and seeing how strong he could be, how real and how true. Did you see, I'm sure you have, Remember those, that line of um, Christians that was uh, beheaded recently by ISIS? And did you see that one of those executioners have now come to Christ as Savior uh, through those testimonies of those, those who so boldly and bravely gave their lives for Jesus? That's an amazing thing. There's victory in standing for Christ. Paul talks about the struggle that they're going to have. The Greek word there is actually the word we bring into the English language is agony. And in their day, they used to talk about it in relationship to the Olympic events that took place and the agonizing that went into the preparation and all the work that they would go through. And um, there's a lot of agony in this life that we can experience, but serving Christ has a point and a purpose. Paul was pointing to that inward struggle that's going to come as we battle against the world who's so opposed to Jesus Christ, so opposed to the gospel. It is highly, highly offensive to those. I'm enough on social media. Most of my contacts are college friends, missionaries, pastors, and things like that. Um, I don't do a lot of Ritman people. I just figure we're here, we know each other. I don't do a lot of Ritman people. But I do from time to time, uh, one of my former players may want to, and, and I try to keep in touch with them just because of relationships and try to have some impact there. And there's one in particular, I love him dearly, 
but he is as opposed to everything that I'm in favor of and vice versa as it can be. And I so much want to uh, say things. I don't do it in the public media thing to him. Uh, I'm, I'm appalled at times at his attacks on Christianity. It's just time and time, almost every single day, there's something there that attacks Christian beliefs and values. That's out there. Um, you know, if there's a little kid in Ritman doing that, he's probably 30 something, but he's still a little kid. Um, but if he's, you know, if that's going on here, it's going on everywhere. People could see how God protected Paul, how he directed him, how he guided him. And they can see that in your life too, as you allow him to be the focal point. And as other people see that in you, it will bolster their faith as well. Uh, it's gonna help them in their time of need as you succeed in serving Christ. The only way to be prepared for all these obstacles of life that are coming at us is to remember what the theme of this chapter is that Paul's writing. Your life must be centered in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, how we thank you for the message of Paul and the life of Paul. What an amazing experience he had. Uh, we don't envy it in any sense. We don't long to be persecuted. But God, we do long for Jesus Christ to be the center of our lives. We long that we can grow in our relationship for him, our passion for him, our desire to know him and to make him known. And Lord, I just pray that you would guide us in the days to come. You have given us such freedoms and such privileges. May we take advantage of those, Lord, to a way that is, of course, pleasing in your sight and, and brings people closer to you. May we learn to serve you and by doing so serve others as well and help them to come closer, to draw nearer to you. God, we pray for your strength, your guidance in the days to come. Whatever the challenges that face us, whatever obstacles, whatever difficulties, may they all be used to build us closer to you so that we can be used in ways that bring exaltation and glory to Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.